Welcome, Kansas Day 2024. We're so excited to be back at Sedgwick County Zoo, and they do such amazing things for, um, you know, for animals, but also for the city of Wichita. And I am here with one of my great friends, Shanae. We got a nice tour of some of the different prairie animals and things like that, so I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Clint. Well, welcome, everybody, and happy 163rd birthday to Kansas. I was just reading something that I thought was interesting and that Kansas is a little unusual in that not every state celebrates their birthday every year. Sometimes they do a centennial or something like that, but we here in Kansas are so proud that we're going to celebrate it every day. Now, one every year, one of the things that I love to tell people is that I have been able to travel all over the world, but I have never seen any place that is more beautiful than our very own state of Kansas. The rolling hills, the rocky hills, the grasses, the forests. Kansas is really blessed with having a huge diversity of habitats. And today, here at Sedgwick County Zoo, we're gonna go through our North American area and really highlight and focus on some of those prairie species. So today, as we go through, we're gonna talk about some um, decomposers, some pollinators, some herbivores or plant eaters, and some carnivores, some meat eaters. So thank you for joining us during your lunch and learn time for learning more about the Kansas Prairie. Now we're even more excited because throughout the time we're going to be visited by several of our zookeepers that are here to tell us a little bit more about how they care for the animals. Now, one of the most important things for us to do was to start here in our Kansas Prairie, right with the prairie dogs, which are one of the most iconic species of the Kansas prairies. As a matter of fact, some researchers will say that without prairie dogs, the prairie ecosystem could not survive. The reason for that is all their jobs. They do so many different things on our prairie. One, they help uh, provide homes for other animals. So often you'll see as you look at those different burrows, not only do the prairie dogs live there, but salamanders live there, owls live there, box turtles live there, skunks, all sorts of animals, snakes will also go into those tunnels and live. The other thing that they do is they help provide food for many other animals in Kansas as well. So they're a resource all the way around and they're an awful lot of fun to watch. Now, in some parts of the state, you might be able to look out your window and see a prairie dog village and other parts of the state, not so much. Prairie dogs like to live in what we call the short grass prairies. Those short grass prairies are the areas where the prairie dogs, when they stand up, they can look around and see all around them. They don't want to be in a place where the grasses are taller than they are because they always have to be vigilant or looking out for those predators that might want to make them a snack. So the prairie dogs will live in large areas called colonies where there can be thousands of prairie dogs at a time. Now, here's something that will surprise some of you. We often think about different habitats around the world and how those habitats are disappearing. We talk about rainforests and coral reefs and how, they're how those areas are shrinking, but we often forget about our grasslands. 97% of all grasslands here in North America are gone. It's important for us to remember that although agriculture crops are very important to us, they are not prairie, they are an agricultural crop. So even if you're driving through Kansas and you see those beautiful fields of wheat and the sunflowers and the soybeans and the corn, that's all awesome but it's not necessarily habitat for animals. So it's important that we always have a balance, that we leave a place for animals like prairie dogs and that we have places for those resources that we need as well. Now, I'm very happy to introduce one of our zookeepers here at Sedgwick County Zoo. Brian Helton um, is one of our zookeepers that has been here for, gosh, well over 20 years. Been in the North American area since 1997. 1997. So, Brian, tell us a little bit about the prairie dogs and how you guys care for them each day. Well, we come through every day, walk the exhibit, look for uh, anything that we need is out of the ordinary. If we get rain, we got to look to make sure uh, none of the burrows were caved in. 
Uh, we walked the exhibit just to make sure everything looks good. It's, it's, it's how we left it the day before. Uh, we'll come through, pick up any old food, um, animal waste. Um, then we'll come through, put in some new uh, prairie hay, which they use as bedding and food. Uh, they get a granular pellet. We'll scatter that. And then they get um, lettuce. We'll scatter that. Once a week, we'll give them a little variety. We'll do scatter some apples or sweet potatoes. Um, and then fresh water also. Uh, one thing, too, right now we're looking for is uh, the animals when they come up. Any injuries, we're getting ready to go into breeding season for prairie dogs. So one thing that's kind of fun is they're going to be a lot more active, a lot more vocal. So there's going to be ready to be a lot more activity out here. So we're kind of keeping an eye on that, too. We kind of strategically try to place some different logs and different stuff in the way with the different family groups and the different fighting that goes on to help maybe taper that a little bit. So that's kind of the gist of what we do every day with them. They kind of are self-sufficient, though. They kind of just take care of themselves. They got their own little mm -hmm. habitat and environment here. They do their own thing. And a lot of their life is uh, underground. Now, Brian, one of the things that I think is so clever here is how you hide the water sources. There's a lot of prairie dogs there, which means there's a lot of different places they need to have water. So give everybody a little sneak idea of how we set that system up in this habitat. Yeah, well, one thing with the prairie dogs, a lot of their water bowls that we have for them are behind all these logs that you see out here. And then we also have some a cover over them with what we've used either plywood or some natural bark covering to shade those water dishes so they stay nice and cool. And so in the summer, we may have to come through here two, three times a day and dump them, give them fresh uh, water. But prairie dogs actually do get a lot of their uh, moisture from the vegetation they eat. So here, the lettuce, uh, the apples, sweet potatoes, they get a lot of their moisture and, and liquids they need from those. So they really do, actually don't drink a whole lot of water, but the water they do drink, we provide for them out here behind these logs and keep them shaded so they constantly have some nice, cool, fresh water. Now, Brian, I noticed there's a net over us here. Um, was there a particular reason why we netted this area in? Yes, uh, years ago, we had a hawk that was spending a lot of time here and uh, was able to pick off a few of the prairie dogs. So uh, to protect them from predators, we covered it. Um, it also has benefited us in the uh, winter months where we had a lot of wild ducks geese come in and would try to steal all their food that we have scattered throughout the exhibit. So this way it benefits us uh, basically year round with birds of prey and then also the native uh, ducks and geese that would come by and try and get a free easy meal mm -hmm. stealing the prairie dog's food. One of the things that always fascinates me about prairie dogs is their ability to climb. Because they live on the prairie, most people think they could never climb anything. But tell us a little bit how we've had to renovate this habitat over the years because of that amazing climbing ability. Yeah, yeah. You, you wouldn't think, you know, they could climb, but they, they do have that ability somewhat to do climb. So as you can kind of notice their outer perimeter of their exhibit, it's kind of tapered inward. So that way, with that overhang, when they do kind of climb up, there's only a certain point they can get up that wall before it starts to curve in too much where they can't climb over. So it doesn't take much for them to get a little foothold with their claws to be able to climb up stuff. So we've had to, kind of, we've had to modify it years ago to make sure and they wouldn't get out because we see them trying to climb up, up the wall. So they do have that ability. Now, earlier today, we saw some of them going to their mounds and taking their heads and kind of pounding their heads up against that mud on the mounds. What are they doing yeah, that for? Yeah, yeah. Well, especially as muddy as it's been out here, they're having to, in the rain we had and the snow melted, it's kind of messed up some of their burrows. So they're constantly out here doing dirt work, reconstruction. They're construction workers. They're construction workers. They're constantly out here redoing their mounds. So you'll see the dirt work, them pushing the dirt around, building their mounds up. Um, so they're constantly, and, and down below, they're constantly redoing the rooms down there in tunnels. Now you mentioned down below. That's one of those pieces I think that always fascinates everyone to realize that there's as much activity going yes. on down below yeah. as there is up top. So tell us a little bit about those tunnels and how we keep them in. Okay, so underneath this exhibit, we have some uh, stainless steel mesh chain link material that's underneath all this real fine mesh so they cannot dig down under 
except for what exhibit they have here. And then the wall is tied into that with the concrete. So we able to contain them then in this environment. Their tunnels, they can be up to six feet deep, 14 feet long, and several different rooms and chambers that they have in there. They'll have a nursing chamber and different chambers where they'll, they'll nest and bed down. Um, so it's, it's like a, it's, you know, a prairie dog town. They have their family, they have their homes and they have different rooms. So Now, one of the things that I read once about prairie dogs that always fascinated me is unlike other animals, when prairie dogs have offspring, the parents then move out of that tunnel area and will move to the outskirts of the town because they're, the parents hopefully are a little smarter yes. and a little bit of, uh, able to take care of themselves and those youngsters that are always yes. staying in the yes. middle. Yes. So that's, that's leaving them in, in more familiar territory. Mm -hmm. The animals that are older, more experienced will move out. And also too, it's kind of for the males, a lot of them will move out that are related animals um, for breeding purposes. That way you don't have inbreeding. So, uh, you have more mm -hmm. non-related animals. So the uh, related males would move out farther and, and mate uh, with different animals. We notice a whole lot of vocalizations going on. I hear some, some, some barking and some chirping. When do they make those different vocalizations? Is there a specific purpose to them? They do have, they have actually 12 different vocalizations they do. And like I said earlier, they're starting to do a lot more of them now that we're getting into breeding season. There's a lot more fighting and, and posturing and uh, they do it when they stand up and the all clear sign. A lot of times they'll do it when they see us because they recognize us. We come over here every mm -hmm. single day to feed them and, and they'll vocalize and make certain noise. So they, they have different meanings with alert, for, uh, you know, bird of prey, mm -hmm. predators mm -hmm. coming, uh, all clear. Uh, different vocalizations that mean stuff to them as far as leave me alone or you know everything is good you can approach so yes always activity in yeah, here very social very mm -hmm. very social animals so they're fun to watch because they're always doing something now i know i mentioned at the very beginning that about 97 98 percent of all prairie dog habitat has been changed and is maybe no longer necessary uh as good for them one of the things we see here in our state of Kansas is even though we think of them as a common animal, they actually could be listed as threatened species here in our state. So folks out there, it's always important to remember even those animals you think of as just the animal that's in your backyard, we have to make sure that we're always thinking about the care and the concern and the resources that they need to stay healthy and happy. Brian, thank you so much for joining us here at Prairie Dogs and helping everybody learn a little bit about this just fantastic prairie icon species. I know we're going to join back with you in just a few minutes over at Bison. So yes. thanks. And we'll learn a little bit more about those as well. All right, guys, let's go ahead and take a walk. And uh, as we go, as we go, we'll look at some different uh, prairie areas, including some pollination areas. One of the great things with Sedgwick County Zoo is there's always places to walk and to learn and to watch and to have a great time. Our prairie area at Sedgwick County Zoo is over 10 acres, and that allows us to really be able to see a lot of animals as we go. Since it's Kansas's birthday, I thought that this might be a graphic that would be interesting for people to watch, talking about bison and that movement of bison throughout North America. One of the things that I have heard before is that you could hear the bison and their rumbling feet as they ran across the prairie before you could ever see them. Sometimes it said it took hours for those bison herds to actually clear an area. Uh, as we industrialized and turned our prairies over to agriculture, one of the things that we see is that uh, those bison populations also declined. We're going to talk a little bit more about bison and the work the zoos are doing to help make sure that our bison survive. Now, it's hard to imagine right now, but the area that we are walking through is actually a pollinator garden. Uh, we work with 
uh, one of the local architecture firms and their staff come in every year and work to plant native wildflowers in this area. Now you might ask yourself, why are native wildflowers so important? They're important because our very own native species depend on them. There's a lot of plants that are beautiful out there, but our native plants are specifically made to help our native species. So when you're looking this spring at planting flowers in your front yard, take a moment to think about those natives. We have some beautiful natives like the, the purple cone flower um, that really can make a wonderful addition to your yard and also help our native pollinators as we go. One of the most fascinating things that I've recently learned is that Kansas has more than four hundred different types of bees. Of bees, can you imagine just bees? 400 different types. Now, not all of those make honey. Some are carpenter bees. Some have uh, bee, are bees that dig underground, but all those bees have a different job that they're able to do as they go. One of the things that we often encourage everyone to do is remember your backyard is Kansas and your backyard is habitat. So take some time each and every day to look at the animals in your backyard, to look at the plants in your backyard, and to see what you can do to make a habitat for our Kansas animals. Whether it be um, a, a, a cardinal, or a squirrel, or a rabbit, or an opossum, there's always small things that we can do, including just small things like creating toad houses. The woodhouse's toad is a very common animal that we can often find around our houses. You can tell it's a woodhouse's toad by its call. The call kind of sounds like a crying baby. It goes, wah, wah. So if you hear that at night, you could have woodhouse's toads. Now you might be like, Shanae, why do I care about a toad in my yard? Because toads do a great benefit to us they help us eat insects. So those moths and those June bugs and those mosquitoes that are flying around your lights at night, the Woodhouse's toads help eat those. And when they do that then, it makes it a, a better place for all of us. Now, one of the things that I think is super fun about Woodhouse's toads is their poop. Yep, I said it, poop. Poop is one of the most important things we even have here at the zoo in making sure that our animals are safe and healthy. But Woodhouse's toads are amazing because they're not that big. They're maybe the size at the most of a, say a baseball or a softball. But their poop is huge. It's the size of cat poop. That's pretty big. So often people will come out in the mornings and think that the neighbor's cat has been in their yard. But in truth, it was a Woodhouse's toad helping keep those insect populations down. There's one real easy way to tell if that's what it was, and that's to look at that poop. You don't have to touch it, just look at it. And if, it, if you can see lots of little bug bodies, then you know it was a Woodhouse's toad, and you can pat yourself on the shoulder for having a really good habitat for some of our native species. Well, let's go ahead and keep walking up the boardwalk here. And we're going to see if we can take a peek at one of the most elusive animals in our state. It's an animal that until recently, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks really didn't even want to say that they lived here. And that's the cougar, or mountain lion, or catamount, or ghost of the Rockies. It has lots and lots of different names. Oh, guys, we're in luck. One of the cougars is right up tall on their perch, looking out and kind of taking a rest in the sun. Well, cougars or mountain lions are really interesting animals. They are native here to Kansas, but often we don't ever see them because they're most active when we are not active. And for, as I mentioned, uh, for years, we weren't sure if they were actually here or not. What they believe has happened is kind of twofold. One, they believe that there were people that had cougars as pets, which is not something we recommend, so please don't go out and do that. And those cougars accidentally got out. 
they then were able to reproduce here in our state. The other thing that they think has happened is cougars have slowly moved in from some other states. The reason that it's thought that those two things occurred is that uh, cougar sightings started occurring in the middle of the state. And a cougar's natural behavior is they kind of piggyback each other. So if one cougar lives in an area, another one might move in close. And then they might move up a little bit and then move up a little bit. Rarely would you find an animal just right there in the middle. Now we saw our one cougar up high, but if we look a little closer, we can see one down low here too. Let's see if we can spot her. She's hiding really well right here in the, the trees. Oh, she's a sneaky one, isn't she? See, we don't wanna go too far around the corner, but let's just go right around the corner here a little bit. And you can see why even though this is a large animal, it's so elusive and so hard to find in the wild. Maybe right here we can see a little bit more of that body as they hide. Now this is a big animal. This is bigger than most of your dogs. But look how quickly it blends into that habitat. And that's one of the things that Kansas species are known for is being able to blend in and hide. Now that's called camouflage. And I bet most of our students out there know that. So hopefully you never come eye to eye with a cougar, but they're certainly neat to see that they ha we have them living in our state. Now we're gonna go look at one of the largest animals that's in our state. We're gonna walk around and give you guys a chance to maybe spy one of our bison. Now, first you might notice that I called them bison and not buffalo. So that's Kansas song, Home on the Range where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard, not a discouraging word. Sometimes they've got the animal names wrong. We don't have um, uh, antelope here, for example, in Kansas. We have pronghorn, which are similar to antelope, but not quite the same thing. And then of course we have the bison. Now bison originally got the nickname of buffalo for a couple of reasons. One, they looked a lot like the buffalo that uh, people were used to seeing in Africa uh, when they were on safaris there. Because of that, then they came and saw the same large animal and thought, wow, it must be the same kind of thing. Two, they look a little bit like the buffalo that you could see in Africa and Asia. Um, and three, one of the native languages called bison buffalo, which meant meat in their language. So those three things combined gave the bison the name, the nickname buffalo, but they are very distinctly different. Now there's a lot of differences. Oh guys, we've got some right down here underneath us too. There's a lot of differences, but one of the most distinct differences that you can see are their horns. When you look at the bison, their horns start at the bottom of the head and go up. When you look at a buffalo, the horns start at the top of the head and go down. So we can see some of those really interesting differences in those particular animals. So if you're here at Sedgwick County Zoo, you can come to the bison and see those horns on the side going up. And then you can go to our farms area and see one of the water buffalo and see how those horns start at the top and go back down. Now again, we're really lucky to have Brian with us today who cares for the bison as well. Brian, tell us about these beautiful Kansas prairie animals. Well, we have a group of females right now. We do have a male that was born back in April, but right now we do not have a breeding herd. Uh, so they can be uh, quite large. A male can be over 2,000 pounds and a female will be up around a thousand pounds. Um, the young, when they're born, average about 70 pounds. So they're big animals. They're also fast animals. They can have a uh, short burst up to 35 miles an hour. So, and they can be aggressive and they're very agile. They're not like a, a bull and a matador where you see them charging. They will charge, but they, they will keep looking at you. They don't close their eyes. So you definitely have to respect them. And, uh, 
just what they can do. And mm-hmm. like Shanae said, uh, some of the differences between the bison and the buffalo. Also, uh, buffalo, or like the Cape buffalo, the water buffalo, they do not have a hump. If you look at the bison, they have the hump on their back there. Also, the bison have the beards. So that's, that's a good way to tell them apart. Also, shorter hunt horns. Like Shanae was saying, the water buffalo, Cape buffalo will have a lot longer horn spread. These guys only have about a three foot horn spread. Um, also, they have more hair. They can tolerate the cold weather, the cold temperatures. The water buffalo, Cape buffalo cannot handle the cold temperatures like these guys. Brian, one of the things that fascinates me so much about the bison is their genetics. Um, The fact that when bison populations declined to almost extinct, one of the ways that we kept the, uh, the species alive was to breed them with cattle. And because of that now, most of the bison here in North America are actually not true bison. But here at Sedgwick County Zoo and several other zoos, we're working with Nature Conservancy to preserve that that uh, 100% pure genetics with bison. Yes, yes, and some of the bison here are from the Nature Conservancy. I'll sign here about that. And that's one of the places, Tall Grass Prairie Preserve, uh, where we do genetic testing. And some of these places like the Nature Conservancy, Tall Grass Prairie Preserve, to make sure we are getting pure bison genetically and then make sure we're breeding with other bison that are genetically pure so like Shanae was talking about too with habitat loss there's limited space so sometimes rely on uh, ranchers private land to have satellite herds where if something would happen to one herd we wouldn't lose all that valuable genetics and we'd have different uh, a different herd that we could use some of these from it when we started like Shanae said we we lost so much habitat bison used to number over 60 million now there's only about 500,000 so with habitat loss over hunting a lot of these animals like the prairie dog the bison uh, a little bit we'll talk about the black-footed ferret they all rely on each other but when the habitat's gone or they're over hunting we start losing the animals we start losing genetics and you get these smaller numbers, you start having to worry about inbreeding and a lack of genetic diversity. So it's important that we started with uh, the bison in Yellowstone and some bison in South Dakota, where we had some original herds started. Some of those animals went out across the country to start new herds and other satellite herds on private land. So we have some where you can go out to the Flint Hills and see your bison, like our bison here, where they so it's, it's important. So the prayer really is a puzzle. It All those pieces is. have to they, fit everything, together. Everything fits together. You, you wouldn't think so, but everything has a purpose. One of the things that I think is so interesting about bison too, uh, we see them sunning themselves here, but is those, those, those wallows. Yes. The wallows are an area where the bison naturally will go and flip themselves around and and maybe take a dirt bath, but in doing that, they leave a divot. And that divot becomes such a resource for other animals because sometimes on our dry prairies, it's one of the only sources of water for other animals. Yeah. You can kind of see where they're laying, the two up front closest to it where they're laying, it is a little bit lower right there. That's a spot they kind of always kind of like to lay and they get up, they roll. So it, it's starting to form that divot, like Shanae said, and that will hold water when it rains that other animals can come use that to drink out of it. If they're rolling around into different grasses, they may get some uh, seeds mm-hmm. in their fur. And then as they travel, those seeds, seeds drop off and germinate. Um, also, when they roll around, though, it's, it's their bug relief. They get all that dust on them and stuff and get, keep, helps keep those bugs off them. Now, Clint, I don't know if you just got the, but one of the bison just went to the bathroom. Everything poops. We just talked about poop with the Woodhouse's toad. So one of the fascinating things that a study was done on bison and cattle poop um, in the prairie was that the founded areas where there were bison or cattle, 
the box turtle populations, again, the ornate box turtles are Kansas State reptile, the box turtle populations are larger. And we thought, why in the world does a box turtle care if there's more bison and cattle? And it's all about the poop. When the animals defecate or poop, what happens is a lot of different insects will come to that and eat some of that decaying matter. The box turtles then are omnivores. They eat plants and meat. And believe it or not, those bugs are meat. So those clever little box turtles would learn that they could go up to that bison or cattle pie, the poop, break it open with their sharp claws and eat the bugs living inside. So kids, be glad you're not a box turtle or you might be getting lunch from one of those cow pies out there. That was great. Brian, thank you so thank much you. for meeting us here with the bison. We're gonna keep walking along on the boardwalk and maybe even see some of our Kansas native water species. Now we've talked a lot about the Kansas prairie and the grasslands. It's important to know that there are three different types of grasslands, the short grass prairies, the mixed grass prairies, and then the tall grass prairies. Generally our tall grass prairies are along our Eastern side and our short to mixed grass prairies are along the central and Western areas. But we also have woodlands. If you go either up northeast or sometimes even southeast, you'll see some of the beautiful wooded areas where we have the joy of finding lots of unique animals there as well. Even right here in Wichita, uh, where we have treed areas near our waterways, you can find animals like bald eagles. So there's always things to see in Kansas. It's an important reminder though, just because this might look frozen doesn't mean it is. So please remember to never cross over onto these icy areas, just like we may fall in. Sometimes those animals fall in as well, but as we saw from those bison's woolly coats, they're a little better adapted to surviving on those cold weather uh, events than we would be. So we're gonna walk down and around. We're gonna kind of look at some of our trees. As a matter of fact, you see some of our largest trees there. Those are our Kansas state tree, the cottonwood. Cottonwoods are found along waterways because they need lots and lots of water. When they're uh, placed closer into the prairies without a water source, one of the things that we find is that they suck up too much water. That's also one of the reasons in our prairie areas, we try and mitigate or get rid of cedar trees. Now you can see one of the cedars right over here. It's that evergreen tree that stays green all year. And they do have a great purpose in that they provide lots of shelter for animals. And they also provide, in some cases, a berry that the animals can eat. But they also are a huge water resource. Um, and especially in times of drought, it's even more important that we don't take that water out of the prairie ecosystem by unwanted trees. One of the reasons why Kansas does annual prairie burns is to try and get rid of those trees. So if you've ever been traveling in Kansas in the springtime uh, or sometimes in the fall, you might notice that parts of the Flint Hills are on fire and that's purposeful. They do that because burning off that grass that's dead allows the new grass to grow and be much healthier and hardier. So those prairie burns are an important part of our prairie ecosystem. Now we're gonna turn the corner here and oh my gosh, guys, we're gonna have a moment to see our state, our national symbol, the bald eagle. Maybe she's even gonna talk to us a little bit. This is the bald eagle. Now, bald eagles are a Kansas staple. Um, as a matter of fact, we have several nesting areas right here in our state, um, and we're seeing that the bald eagle populations continue to increase. Unlike some other 
raptors or birds that eat other animals, bald eagles are fish eaters. So you'll find them along our Kansas waterways, whether it be our ponds or our rivers, because they need that open water where they can continue to get fish. Now, as you guys can see, they're not bald. They get the name because those white feathers on the top of their heads gives them that bald appearance as they go. We'll go ahead and walk over here where we'll run into some Kansas waterfowl. Kansas is known for their waterfowl. As a matter of fact, people come from all over the world during migrations to see Kansas's wildlife. Wow, could you hear that? What a beautiful sound. So our two bald eagles that we have here at Sedgwick County Zoo are animals that are non-releasable. They're animals that lived in the wild and sometimes they have accidents. Sometimes they uh, get tangled up in power lines. Sometimes they get hit by cars. Sometimes maybe their feet or their wings get caught up in fishing line. That's why we can be a force for nature by simply being aware of wildlife around us, picking up our trash, recycling what we can, reusing what we can, and then throwing out the things that can't have anything else done with them. That helps animals like bald eagles live much healthier here in our state. Now, some of the other animals that we have in our state are some of those waterfowl. Now, if you look in here, we have widgeons and pintails and teals, and one of my favorites, the tiny little ruddy duck, um, and poachers are all different waterfowl that are in here. Now, they're doing what a lot of us wanna do, and they're taking that mid-morning break, taking a little rest. But Kansas is known for having a large amount of waterfowl because we are in what's called the Central Flyway. Now, just like you guys, when you go on vacation, your parents probably map out a, a route. You don't just get in the car and drive willy-nilly anywhere. You have a goal and an objective. Our waterfowl do too. So they stay in general pathways as they fly, and we are in the Central Flyway which I think is the best flyway of all the flyways in the United States, because we get such a large diversity of, of uh, birds as they migrate through. The waterfowl, like the ducks, are pretty common, and that's where, again, some of those Kansas waterways are so important. Folks, if you have a chance to go to Cheyenne Bottoms, it's a great place to look at all sorts of wildlife. Different ducks like this, the Sandhill Cranes, uh, pelicans, which yes, we have pelicans here in Kansas. And if you're lucky, you may even get to see one of the most endangered animals in North America, the whooping crane. So we should be really proud of the beautiful animals that we have right here in Kansas. They're everywhere. Now, we've looked at mammals, we've looked at birds, but that's not all. We also have some pretty darn cool reptiles here in the state of Kansas. As we come up here to our prairie building, one of the things we'll see is some of those different habitats that we find along in Kansas and some of the animals that call them home. So our prairie rattlesnake, you'll see will live on our western side of Kansas and they like the prairies, but they also like those dry rocky areas. So if anybody's been out to say Little Jerusalem or some of those areas, you might have had the opportunity to uh, hopefully run into a rattlesnake from a little ways away. One of my favorite venomous snakes here in Kansas is the Osage Copperhead. Now you might say, Shanae, you're crazy. But when you see how beautiful that animal is, how can you not be amazed by it? Again, these are animals that like to live in more of the woodlands of Kansas. And again, that's one of the great things about our state. We have those prairies. We have the woodlands um, and we have those aquatic areas. So we get such a depth of different animals here in our state. Even if you're not a fan of snakes, know that they do a great job here in our state, making sure to keep that prairie puzzle together at all times.
Now, now we're going to end our program today with one of our other zookeepers, Lindsay. Lindsay's here to talk to us about one of the most amazing animals anywhere in the world, and that's the black-footed ferret. The reason why I say the ferrets are one of the most amazing animals anywhere in the world is because at one time we actually thought they were extinct. We thought they were completely gone off the planet until a farmer's dog named Shep found one out in the field and brought it up to his owner's uh, back porch. That rancher luckily was smart enough to realize that was something pretty unusual and unique um, and was able to help contact the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service where we found the last remaining population of black-footed ferret in the world. Now that wasn't here in Kansas, but luckily because of really good breeding programs, we have been able to re-release black-footed ferrets into the state of Kansas and we now have them living wild. What's the most important thing to a black-footed ferret population? Prairie dogs. We met them at the beginning. We saw how cute they were, and we talked about how they provide homes and other resources for animals. Black-footed ferrets are specialists. The only thing that they usually eat are prairie dogs. So a robust prairie dog population also means a healthy black-footed ferret population. Lindsay, tell us about one of the newest exhibits here at Sedgwick County Zoo. So if we want to come over here okay. and see our black-footed ferret exhibit, we have two ferrets that live here, but we only ever have one on exhibit at a time because they don't play well together. So they're solitary animals in the wild. So we keep them solitary here at the zoo. But as you can see, this exhibit looks a lot like you found at the prairie dog exhibit. It's basically like you took a cross section of a prairie dog burrow and you're looking inside of it. That's because the black footed ferrets are totally reliant on prairie dogs, not just for food, but also for their homes. So they will move into unused prairie dog burrows and that's where they will make their home. And then at night, they will come out and visit other nearby prairie dog burrows and that's where they will capture a prairie dog to eat. Now tell us about how we care for these particular prairie dogs. You already mentioned that they're, although we have two, neither of them are on exhibit together. How do we maneuver them back and forth? Yeah, so we have two ferrets. Um, we have one on exhibit and then one in an off exhibit area. And we move them back and forth um, by connecting a really long tube between the exhibit and their off exhibit space. Um, we figured they're most comfortable in that kind of tube-like structure. So um, we originally were shifting them back and forth with uh, little mesh boxes, but we discovered very quickly that they don't like being confined. Um, we've only been taking care of these ferrets since last, not this past December, but December of 2022. So they are new to us as well. So they've been teaching us what they like to do and how they like to move around. So we will connect a long tube between exhibit and off exhibit area and they will go through the tube and that's how we shift them on and off so we can clean each area. Now we talked about in the wild that they would eat mainly prairie dogs. Mm -hmm. We're obviously not feeding them prairie dogs here. So what do they eat on a daily basis? So they will get um, some meat every day, just a, a beef blend, but they will also get whole prey every day in the form of either mice or rats. We give them completely whole and the ferrets will eat all of it. Now, if people are here at the zoo, they might see the, the black-footed ferrets sleeping most of the time. How come? That's because they are nocturnal. Um, sometimes in the wild, you will see them up at dusk or dawn if you're lucky, um, but they are pretty much nocturnal. And so that's because prairie dogs tend to be diurnal. Prairie dogs are active during the day. So the ferret is nocturnal. The ferret comes out at night to capture a sleeping prairie dog. I know there's a lot of students out there that stay up way later than they should. <clears throat> if they wanted to maybe see one of the black-footed ferrets moving around at night, is there a way they can do that? So, yeah, they can uh, scan our live animal camera here and you might get a glimpse of, or you can visit our website where you can access that as well. And you might get a glimpse of them running around on exhibit overnight if you're lucky. Now, Lindsay, I know that we work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in the state of Kansas to go out and help with the prairie dog census. 
tell us what that involves. Yeah, so we will travel out to the release site that is in Western Kansas for Blackfooted Ferrets. And basically what we do is we wait until it's dark and then a bunch of us will go out in a vehicle and shine high powered spotlights around. And we are looking for their characteristic eye shine. So if you've ever like let your dog outside at night, you might see that their eyes kind of shine a little bit. And that's exactly what we're looking for in the ferrets. Um, the ferrets are known for their characteristic emerald green eye shine. So we will look and see if we can see some eye shine and then we will set a trap at that burrow and then come back later and see if the ferret is in the trap. Once they are trapped, they are given a quick medical examination, vaccines, all that kind of stuff, and then we re-release. That's great. So it really helps us not only make sure that those ferrets are protected with those vaccinations, but it gives us an idea of how many are out there and whether they're having babies themselves out there or yeah. not. And how has the Kansas population been doing? It's been successful. Um, I think there was a slight growth this past year. Um, they are still considered endangered. It's hard to know exactly how many ferrets are in a particular location because they are fossorial mammals, which means they live underground. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're also nocturnal, so they're like really hard to find out how many are in an area. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us and letting us uh, share more about the black-footed ferrets. Again, one of the most endangered animals in the entire uh, United States. So it's great to have them here at Sedgwick County Zoo. Now. I just noticed something really cool behind us. We've talked about all sorts of animals, but normally during the winter, we don't have much opportunity to talk about our invertebrates. But let's go look at our Kansas State insect because I can see they are out and about. Guys, this is one of my favorite places in the whole zoo. As crazy as it is, it's because it's a log. It used to be a live tree, but the tree died. When the tree died, what we noticed was that there were honeybees living inside. So we capped the tree and hoped that the bees would stay there. They didn't. They left us about a year later. But lo and behold, last year, they came back. So we're really excited to be able to host uh, native or uh, honeybees as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's 400 different types of bees. Honeybees are bees that specifically go out, collect the nectar and the pollen from our different flowers, and they bring it back to these hives, where what they'll do is they have specialized stomachs and they kind of bleh, the honey back up, they put it into those little honeycombs, and then a worker bee's job is to sit and fan it. Fan it, fan it, fan it, fan it. And they fan the, the uh, nectar in order to get the moisture out. Once they get the moisture out, it becomes that sticky honey that you and I know so well. They also collect the pollen. And what's really cool about bees is they have special little pouches on their, on their sides called pollen pouches. So they'll drink that nectar and they'll shove that pollen in those little pollen pouches, fly it back to their hive where they'll then set it up so that they have food for the winter. Traditionally, all winter long, the honeybees will stay in those hives and not necessarily be very active. But on a beautiful Kansas day like today, to help celebrate Kansas day, those honeybees are out and active and moving around. Now you might say, oh, Shanae, bees sting me. I don't wanna have anything to do with them. They do sting, but remember, if a bee stings you, it's not going to live anymore. So the bee doesn't want to sting you. It only stings you as a last effort. So if you see a bee, the best thing to do is stay still and just slowly walk away. Doing the whole this thing makes the bee afraid. You're a whole lot bigger than they are. And a bee's job is to protect their hive. That is the most important thing. And if they think of you as a threat, they will risk their life in order to protect the lives of the rest of their hive. So really great opportunity also to see our Kansas state insect, the honeybee. Now guys, I know we're almost out of time, but I just saw Lindsay carry some fish over to the otters. So let's walk that way for one last animal and maybe even some time for some questions. Yep, we're down to about five minutes. Okay. So 
One of the questions coming in right now is what's the biggest animal in Canada? Oh, that is a great question. The 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 largest wild animal in Kansas is definitely the bison. No, guys, we're here with probably the most aquatic mammal in our entire state, which is the river otter. Now, river otters are pretty interesting as well because at one point they had pretty much disappeared from our state. And the reason for that was us. We were polluting our waters. River otters need to have pretty crystal fresh water. And as our waterways were getting polluted, what we see is the river otters left with some good conservation work and with a little bit of trading back and forth with the state of Missouri, we were able to repopulate our otter populations here in the state. And now we're really happy to say that we have otter populations still not common, but throughout the state of Kansas. You see that they're eating fish. River otters are fish eaters, so they need to have both that land and that waterway in order to have a healthy habitat for them to survive. You might think, wow, Shanae, how do they stand that cold weather? Well, there's two things that help them. One, that super rich fur. That fur is so thick that they actually have two different types of fur, the guard fur that you see there, and then the under fur. That under fur is so great that it doesn't allow the water to get to the otter's skin. And even though they look super wet, their skin isn't wet at all, which really protects them and uh, allows them to stay safe and healthy, even in our cold Kansas weathers. Guys, I wanna thank you so much for staying and taking the hour of your lunchtime to walk around Kansas with us and to learn about some of the beautiful animals that we share our state with. Now it's your time. Be a force for nature. Get out. Learn about the squirrels. Learn about the raccoons. Learn about the otters, those animals that we share our state with. Now, for any of our adults out there, one of the things you can do too is participate in the Chickadee Checkoff program. Every year during tax time, which is right around the corner, as you're filling out your taxes, you can make a check for wildlife. Those donations will go specifically to non-game wildlife in our state and help make sure that those animals can stay healthy and happy for generations to come. Guys, thanks so much for joining us and have a great day. Thanks so much to Sedgwick County Zoo. Bye everyone, have a great day.